Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the Cedarfield family. Thank you for tuning into this live. Hold on one second. Thank you for tuning into this live stream here on April 7th, Tuesday. We are grateful that you are uh, tuning in uh, with uh, uh, a format today uh, with opening with the Grateful Day. Uh, hopefully many of you saw that uh, video that the pastoral services team uh, found uh, a couple of days ago. We viewed that on channel 970 this morning, just a very powerful video. Thought it would be very fitting to open up uh, with some uh, peaceful, relaxing music and words of inspiration. So uh, the format for today is I have a couple of administrative uh, updates followed by Dr. Shear and Ann Hopper, our wellness clinic RN with the topic of navigating COVID-19. And then I'll come back a little bit later for some additional updates. So hopefully over the past two days, you have seen the governor's uh, update the briefing at two o'clock. And in conjunction with uh, some of the information that the White House uh, COVID-19 task force has been uh, distributing over the last few days, Cedarfield now is under full uh, operation of trying to find a mask for every team member. So again, I just want to thank the seamstresses that have been working very hard. Uh, Mrs. Ramage, Mrs. Schwartz, Mrs. Ayers, Mrs. Peary, uh, Carol, Kent Rowe, Alexander, or I'm sorry, Joanne Alexander, and then certainly Lisa G, our uh, volunteer coordinator. We actually um, we have a team now assembled. We have a couple of sewing machines uh, here on the property. Uh, we have lots of fabric. Uh, James Green actually procured this fabric. This fabric right here is uh, fabric that they wrap uh, surgical utensils with before they go into a uh, room. So we're gonna start making masks out of this uh, particular uh, fabric. And then secondly, the cloth, the cloth uh, masks that everyone's making has a little pocket on them. And these filters are uh, distributed at Lowe's and Home Depot. So we're actively procuring these filters as a way to cut an index card three by five um, size filter from here so that people can put that into the um, filter within the mask. So um, these masks that we're making are really great and the staff are so appreciative. So again, thank you to all the residents that are part of the team making masks, actively making masks for us right now. We have distributed 240 masks over the last three days and uh, we hope to make probably another at least a hundred of them over the next two days so that we can be rest assured that every team member, every private duty personnel, um, and every agency uh, person has a mask to wear inside of the, uh, inside of the building. So I just want to touch on a personal story uh, in relation to maybe your personal pathways to wellness. So last night I was talking with my mother, Geraldine Shaw, who is 75 years old. And I said, Mom, how are you making out? And she goes on to talk about normal health things with her and my father, who is just recovering from uh, hip surgery three weeks ago. And 
she goes on and tells the story for about five minutes. At the very end of the story, she said the following to me. She says, you know, we're getting along just great because of the nine pathways of wellness that you had at Cedarfield, Michael. During your last visit in February, you shared with us uh, your website and your Touchtown uh, app, and we have been working actively to make sure that we have a balance of our own well-being, and we have your nine domains posted on our court board. So they have a little scorecard that they keep track of. So, that is, my mom inspired me last night, along with the wellness team, and we have drafted for you a scorecard. So, with your meal delivery tonight, you're gonna receive two pieces of paper. One is gonna be the scorecard, which you see here. You can see on the first column are eight of the dimensions of well-being. There is one missing, which is called uh, the social well-being for obvious reasons. So here are the other eight dimensions of well-being, and uh, we are gonna, we're gonna give you a scorecard every week to keep, a bet, keep score of the things that you're doing within each of these eight domains of well-being to track to make sure that you have a balance. So that's the first piece of paper. The second piece of paper is gonna go into, uh, this is a double-sided print, to go into the eight uh, domains of well-being. Here are four of them, creative expressions, a healthy body, emotional balance, and uh, dining, diet, and nutrition. And then on the back side of the page happens to be intellectual growth, spirituality, uh, outreach, and brain fitness. So hopefully uh, you will utilize this scorecard and uh, be able to really concentrate each day on trying to find your well-being. Maybe your well-being isn't something in all eight every day. Maybe you draw on more of your energy through um, your spiritual health, um, but at least this will give you a little a gauge and a guide to assure yourself that you are at least attempting to uh, log your activities related to your own well-being. So again, you'll receive a copy of the scorecard today with your meal delivery, and then next Tuesday we'll start all over again and give you another scorecard for the week. So, hope you enjoy that. Okay, next up, we are gonna go right into navigating COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Amy Shear and Ann Hopper are here to uh, give us some insights. We have, I think we have about 12 questions that they have pre-prepared, given uh, questions that the residents have been calling down to the clinic and asking of Ann and Dr. Shear. So. Starting with what Michael was starting 
talking about the mask. If I have a mask, should I be wearing one? So um, that's a good question. And uh, while cloth masks themselves don't tend to be very good at preventing you from getting COVID, um, they are great for preventing you from touching your mouth and your nose, um, as well as, as you are coughing, really containing that um, to where it's not spreading as easily. So even the governor himself has said that we all should wear some kind of covering over our face, and that's mainly for the good of our fellow man. Um, as you get filters and as that cloth mask that you're using um, gets more tightly woven, um, and a way to tell that would be to kind of hold it up to the sun or a bright light. If you're seeing a lot coming through, it's probably not as effective of a mask as one where you can hardly see any light coming through. Um, the only thing that really protects against um, aerosolized virus um, would be an N95 mask, but our recommendation right now is that if you have one available, and if you have a mask available, yes, go ahead and start wearing it, um, especially if you're going outside of your um, apartment or going on a walk or, or maybe in contact or you know closer than six feet from somebody else. So yeah, if you have one, there's no recommendations right now not to be wearing it. So. Okay. Will it be mandatory at Cedarfield is the next question. Right now, I don't believe it's mandatory. Um, but again, given the fluidity of all of this, that could change by, you know, at any point. Um, again, it, there's, you know, it just depends on what the availability is, um, as well as, you know, recommendations from, you know, everywhere. So, um, right now, I wear a mask whenever I see people um, for all my patients, and that's, again, really to protect my patients from me, mm -hmm. um, and because I'm much more of a risk than they necessarily are, you know, staying in their rooms or staying in their apartments, but, you know, I still have, I still have to go grocery shopping, and I still have to go out in the world. So I think it's important for me to protect my patients from what I might be exposed to. Sure. And it sounds like the team members will be required to wear it. And once they're available, which sounds like they'll be ready in the next day or two, once everyone could have a cloth mask and they'll have the filter, they'll be able, they'll be required to wear it here in the field. I think that's a good idea. All right, this is not at Cedarfield, but it would pertain to everyone at Cedarfield. Dr. Shear, how do you get your groceries? Well, um, so I guess last time we talked about what, what we do when we go home, right? right? How do we enter our homes? Um, so for grocery, for me right now, what I'm doing is we, we do online ordering. Um, I still find the Amazon Fresh, and maybe it's because I'm delivering baby formula, so we get pretty good response times. So we don't have to wait a week. Um, so I've been able to get most of my groceries that way. Um, so that's really what, what we do, is online ordering, and then it gets delivered to our house. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. What do you do, Anne? Well, I have a daughter old enough to go shopping for me, so I don't even have a list anymore because, as everyone knows, there's hardly anything at the grocery store. So pretty much whatever she can get, I'm happy that she's bringing it home. So she does not want me to go to the grocery store. So I pretty much come to work, and I go home, and then I go outside to walk. I know in our neighborhood, um, because we have kind of young and old on our street, we've kind of, there have been people that have decided to do the grocery shopping for their neighbors. And I think for your children and everyone else, kind of, again, if we can minimize the contact anywhere, I think we all should be working on that. So if, you know, your neighbor is going to the grocery store, you know, and this would be a good recommendation to talk to your kids about, you know, if your kids can decrease the amount of contact they have, I know we're all 
chomping, you know, kind of bust open the, the, the walls and, you know, climb out the window because we can't wait to get out. Um, but really, we do need to be kind of staying away as much as we can from the public. From the public, so. Right. Okay, we've had this question before, but it, I think maybe in a little bit more detail. As far as if someone has symptoms, what do they do? And then the second part would be, say they have routine meds through their primary care that they need, and so they don't really know the doctor here. Who do they go to? So, um, you know, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, if you need refills on your medications or you need to talk to a doctor, the best doctor to talk to is actually your primary care doctor. And most doctors, most primary care doctors right now do have telemedicine capability. Um, while, you know, if they don't, you know, I'm happy to, to assist with that, but I also, you know, the best person to see you is not necessarily a doctor that hasn't seen you before or somebody that doesn't have your chart available to them. Um, the best person to be seen by is actually the doctor that, that you know, prescribed your last medication. So it's best to first call your primary care doctor and see if they can do a visit with you and or just refill your medicine without a visit because a lot of them are also doing that. Um, but that would be avenue number one. Now, if, if there's difficulty or a roadblock there, you know, I'm happy to help out because this is just such a unique time and I feel a responsibility and I know Dr. Moravian feels a responsibility to, you know, serve our members here, to serve our residents. And, um, and so we're really kind of willing to go above and beyond and, and you know, be able to meet a need if it's there. But we first want you to go through your, um, your, your own doctor who knows you the best. Okay. And then the symptoms, so they would still reach out to the clinic. Right. And we would, they would reach out to their primary care. But certainly, we could help. And we could even help with the telemedicine with their primary care doctor. Right. Because some of this can be very intimidating. I know technology is not always everyone's best friend. So, you know, having some extra support there, or even doing a trial run with the clinic or the nurse can kind of help you feel comfortable with that. So, um, so you want to call the clinic as well, and they can also help you um, with that kind of technology piece, um, as well as setting up with your, because um, I believe you call almost all of the primary care doctors at one point or another. Um, they probably know your name at most of the clinics here. Um, so that kind of helps facilitate with that. And I've also taken pictures of certain parts, a leg that has something going on, someone's mouth, and I've, the doctors have said either email or texted to them, and then we've been in contact with the doctor and the resident, and that's been helpful too. Because they realize they're not looking for patients to be coming in these days. Yeah, we really want to, we, we don't want anybody in, you know, that 65 and older in a sick waiting room. So, how about testing? Say a resident had the high fever and they were short of breath, what happens next? So, um, so just to kind of go into to kind of the, the nitty gritty of it, we call the health department as it stands. They then send us a test. So we do the test at Cedarfield, but it's the health department that provides us with the test right now. And that's because of the limited amount of these tests um, and also that we want to make sure that we're getting the fastest one possible because um, some of the older ones that we might have access to take six days to get back. So the sooner we can get it back, the, you know, the less we all have to be sitting on pins and needles. So, um, so we're going through the health department right now who has access to those quicker tests. Um, and depending on the situation, they may say if the resident is driving, that they might want them to go to a mobile um, testing center. If they're not and they're here, then they may send us the test and have us perform it. If we are going to perform it, we have very strict criteria of how to put on the proper protective equipment in order to get that test. So it is something that um, we 
have a limited amount of, you have to meet criteria for, and we're not recommending unless you have, you know, symptoms consistent with, and we've been tracking and noticing things are getting worse, something to want to make us want to order that. Um, we don't order them lightly, so. Okay. okay, this is an interesting one. If I'm not worried about dying, and I've lived a good life, why should I stay in my apartment or my cottage and socially isolate myself? Okay, so um, while quality of life is you know, a very important subject to me and I wanna make sure that we have the best quality of life for our residents possible, um, with the pandemic that's going on, some of this isn't about just your wishes. You know, even though you may be prepared to pass away and not worried about, you know, kind of dying, it's not it's not fair right now to put everybody else through that. And and the truth is, it's not all about you right now. It's about your fellow man. And we really need to be focusing on others right now. And part of that is the right thing is really to protect everyone. And in order to do that, we need to stay apart right now. Um, and the key is, is it's just, if we had one positive test here, you know, that's, that creates a, a, a whole host of issues that we then have to, have to worry about. Our caregivers, our, you know, our staff, you know, even if you are okay with dying, there's still gonna be people that are gonna be at your side, and now you're exposing all those people at your side that and it's just not okay that's good that's a tough one all right here a little bit uplifting can i make a dish maybe some deviled eggs or a cake and give it to my neighbor um i think it's i think that's great um right now i think focusing on our neighbors and focusing on other people is very important, and if you want to make a dish for your neighbor um, and drop it off at their doorstep, um, as long as you're not waiting to talk to them and having a whole conversation, um, then I think it's okay to make something for somebody else, leave a nice note or a card, and, um, and, 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 and do that, that you know, helps us focus on others, helps us uplift and encourage each other, and, and, and now is the time to be doing stuff. So yes, I think that's wonderful. Um, I encourage it. Now, everything's taken with a grain of salt. If you're spending all day knocking on everybody's door at Cedarfield, then you're not really practicing your stay-at-home measures. So you know, we can't have extremes of anything. But um, but if you want to give give your neighbor, you know, some cookies or, or something or a healthy snack as well, <laughs> then that would be nice. more than encouraged. Right. Um, so this might go along with that previous one about social distancing. And I think that's part of the problem about going out, right? Is that um, we can't tell that we have these symptoms. We can appear healthy. So the question is a good question. What is asymptomatic? Um, so, you know, a lot of the spread of this virus, they're saying, is from an asymptomatic person. So what does that mean? It means that not everyone is going to have a high fever, a cough, you know, feel awful and have a flu. There are going to be some people that actually have the virus and don't know they have it, or they're in the first couple of days of it before their symptoms really get bad, and yet they are contagious at that time and don't know. So when we're talking about asymptomatic spread, it means they don't have symptoms yet. They don't have the cough, congestion, shortness of breath, fever, but they may be developing it later, or they may not get any symptoms at all, but they're still contagious, and that's what's so dangerous, and that's why really staying apart is so important, um, is because there may be people that you come into contact with, and it's not their fault that they don't know that they have it, but it, it is making you at risk of then getting it and spreading it further. And how long can someone be asymptomatic? Well, they can actually be asymptomatic for the duration, so they can have no symptoms at all for the full 14 days. 
Um, and then there's also, we, I don't know what the latest information is, and I'll have to get back to you on how long it's actually spreadable, but I know it's at least for 14 days that it can be. Um, and it may be longer than that. All right, last week we discussed the vial of life, and I meant to bring the little container that everyone should have in their refrigerator. And you mentioned code status. What's the difference between a DNR and a full code? So, um, so when we talk about code status, we, you know, we usually say you're, you're one or the other. Sometimes we think there's more options because you can have, you know, a, a detailed list and, and other legal documents, but um, the reality is is that um, here in Virginia, you're either a full code, meaning you get everything done, chest compressions, your um, you know respiratory support, you're put on a ventilator, all those things. If you're a do not resuscitate, that means that you still get treatment. So you, would, you, know, you can still call 911, you can still go to the hospital, you can still get medications, it's just you're not gonna get um, extraordinary measures, heroic measures, you wouldn't get chest compressions, you wouldn't be shocked, and you wouldn't be intubated um, for a given you know, amount of time. Um, so that's, you know, so, and we can continue to kind of talk about the difference if there's more questions with that. But, um, but you know, like I said, I, I just think it's a, it's a good time right now to be looking at that. Um, a lot of the times, you know, you, you are by default, everyone is a whole code, because it, in the state of Virginia, if we don't know as physicians and it's not plastered up somewhere, or if a document's not signed completely correctly, maybe it's signed in the wrong spot, um, then you default to a full code, because it's you know, we operate under the assumption that everyone wants everything done, and then we scale back. So if you don't want to be on a ventilator, or if you don't want chest compressions, you know, you want to make sure that you're updating your bottle of life, um, as well as your um, code status, or you get your 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 signed DNR. Okay, perfect. So Lori Shepard was so nice to bring in. This is the container that everyone. Each couple, they should have an individual container and a vial of life, a copy of your current vial of life would be folded up and put in your refrigerator on the top shelf so that we all know where to go if you had to go out to the hospital. We just go right to the refrigerator. Everyone has a refrigerator and we take out your vial of life and send you out to the hospital. Yeah, and the other thing to check that's very important in there is your medication list because that may have changed since the last time somebody looked at that vial of life. So after this program today, I encourage everyone to open up your refrigerator, open up that container, take a look at it. If it needs to be changed, come into the clinic, have that done, and then put it back in the refrigerator. Don't forget to put it back where it was. Exactly. But, um, but you know, we wanna make sure that that's up to date. Right. And hopefully, you won't need it, but it's always a good idea to have it. Right. Prepare for the worst, expect the best, right? right. Okay, so here's my last question. Dr. Shear, I have a fear that the residents could underreport symptoms. What do you have to say to that? Well, I just want to say that, you know, it's it's important right now that, that somebody be checking on. And I think that it, even if the cough is mild, or even if you're short of breath, maybe you just had it for a little bit of time and you didn't think it was that important or severe, I would rather us be taking your temperature and calling and finding out it's nothing to worry about mm -hmm. than I would, you know, we wait till you really, because there may be a way to keep you from having to go to the hospital. And really, our goal is not to have people sent out to the hospital. Our right. goal is to keep you here and keep you healthy and, and, and well monitored, and so that we know what the you know what your body is doing and ways to support you. Um, please don't assume that if you have a fever and you call the clinic, we're going to recommend that you go to the hospital. Right. Okay. That's exactly. We right. really want to try and do everything we can to help you stay where you're at. And also, we want to make sure that we know what the symptoms are and you're not calling us after.
for five days of a high fever, and then all of a sudden very dehydrated. We're able to intervene beforehand, maybe we're able to keep you here. So it's important even with those mild shortness of breath, dyspnea, or sorry, shortness of breath, or you know, um, cough or fever that you, that, that you are calling and letting us know, um, just because we want to make sure that, that you're staying healthy. And for other symptoms as well, if you're concerned about or need intervention, um, we can always put you on the list as well. I don't think we have any other questions. I have one question. Will Cedarfield residents eventually be able to get tested for the virus? Can you repeat the question? So, um, so right now we we Wait, are. I have to ask the question. So the question is, will Cedarfield be able to test for the COVID, for the coronavirus here at Cedarfield? So as it stands right now, what we're doing is we're going through the health department and we are testing here at Cedarfield. So sometimes they're sending the test, we're performing it here, but it's, we're sending the results back to the health department. Now, the newer tests that are out there, I think you're referring to like the Abbott testing, that's yes. a five minute turnaround. Um, there is a possibility, again, fluid, this is a very fluid process, um, and, um, and our availability of everything is changing. It's, it is possible that you know, we may have access in the future, but as it stands right now, um, you know, we're going with the, the health department testing. Um, there's no recommendation to do mass testing for asymptomatic people right now or people without symptoms. Um, and really, we don't want to be using up all the median um, that we use to, to perform these tests on people that don't have symptoms. Um, it would not really be helpful to us, and it would also deplete, you know, the state from, from having, you know, availability to test those that really need to be tested. Now, I did hear that that Abbott test, it's a whole kit that, you know, if you put your little strip in to have it read, and that that is being sent out to hospitals. So that's a good sign. Let yeah. the hospitals get it first, and then maybe and then usually clinics right. and everything else are you know, exactly. it's, it's possible that, you know, by the end of the month or next month, we may have it. But as it stands right now, we don't. And I think the important thing is that we do have availability to test. But, um, and then they are actually, you know, the requirements for our population is actually less strict than, you know, a younger population where they're really making sure they've had fever for a significant amount of time, right. that they have all three symptoms. Now there's, they are kind of saying, okay, well, if there's enough um, suspicion, then they will test without having all three symptoms. So um, as the tests become more available, our ability to get tested um, becomes more available. So. All these construction workers are on campus can't catch COVID-19. Okay. So here's another question. We have construction workers around the campus and a resident wants to know, can they catch the virus from the construction worker? So you can catch the virus from anyone, um, just like you can catch it from you know, the nurses. But anyone that comes onto the Cedarfield camp campus is screened. So the construction workers' temperatures are being taken every day when they come onto campus, just like the nurses and staff and um, and everyone else's. Now, do we need to be cautious about getting too close to anyone right now? Yes. And, and the reality is, is, yes, we can, you know, you can catch it from anyone. But for the most part, we're trying to do what we can to minimize that risk as much as possible. So when it comes to, you know, the construction that's going on, I believe that they're staying within their groups as well. Exactly. So they're not trying to have interaction with the residents. Right, and the majority of them are outside or there's a fenced area that they're working in. All of them, actually, Michael is clarifying for me, they're all outside working in the D wing outside, the health center, they have their own setup. So we're not coming across I haven't seen construction workers inside. And I would not encourage any of our residents to be walking out to the construction workers right now. 
So I mean, part of that is just using our six feet of distance and, and making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to, um, because otherwise, you know, that does decrease your risk. And I have one more question. How important is hydration? They're at home, they're in their apartment or cottage, so they think, oh, I'm not out and about getting hot. I don't need to drink. Well, I think, you know, in general, as we get older, we tend to retain um, urine. And so that's why urinary tract infections are so common. Um, so if we want to be worried about having a temperature right now, the biggest, the most common cause of a temperature in our population is urinary tract infections. The biggest way to prevent getting a urinary tract infection is to continuously flush the system. So if you're drinking lots of water, you're less likely to get um, urinary tract infections. You're more likely to um, be able to have, you know, flushing of that of, of your bladder, so it's not maintaining in the bladder and, and creating a little petri dish for bacteria. So that's the biggest thing. Another thing is it is quite humid today, and the temperatures are getting up there. Um, so it is important to stay hydrated, you know, just so that we don't get dehydrated. If you were to get a virus, any virus, um, you are likely to get dehydrated from that. So being on the extra hydrated side kind of helps combat all those things. So I think uh, staying hydrated is really important right now. Health in general is very important right now. We want to be doing everything we can, you know, to be focusing on, you know, being as healthy as we possibly can because that's just making your risk of this becoming, you know, a, a, a fatal event less and less. Exactly. I know I'm, I'm so aware of getting my sleep and eating right and exercise, and every time I come in and have my temperature taken, I'm so happy when it's normal. <laughs> I think I think everyone can kind of relate to that. So. It's just our new norm. Just want to remind all the residents and team members that are listening, uh, either live or on video, that our main goal at Cedarfield has not changed. Our job here is quite simple. Our job is to flatten the curve so that the healthcare system is not overloaded. Doctors Hospital of Parham and Forest, uh, St. Mary's, we do not want to overload the health system. So social distancing and the executive order of staying at home is absolutely critical and self-quarantining uh, to the best that we can. You can go outside, please enjoy this beautiful weather that Mother Nature is providing for us. Uh, hope we made this announcement yesterday. Hopefully those that were uh, out by the, that are living out by the Parkview entrance didn't really receive too much of an interruption. I heard it was a 20 minute uh, replacement of the repeater. So those of you that have an uh, internet connection out there, uh, it should be as a quarter of four here, that internet connection should absolutely uh, be uh, reconnected. I do not have another location uh, for tomorrow of um, any place within the main building that will experience an internet uh, disruption. Uh, one other thing about construction. So the executive order doesn't really go into a lot of detail about existing uh, construction efforts. And uh, but what the Department of Health said to uh, us yesterday two days ago, on, or I'm sorry, on Friday, said, well, is, it a, is your construction essential? Meaning, what type of construction are you building and what's the timeline of delivery? And they said, are you 
delivering a building under six months and or what's the type of building that is under construction? I said, well, one building, a new deep wing, our new deep wing is due to open up here in June. And so the Department of Health said, you know what, that, that fits our definition. And then I said, we're building a household. And they said, what's, what's household? I said, it's a new term we're trying to redefine here in the city of Richmond. We're building, old term, a new nursing home called a household. And they said, well, that's just perfect. That fits into our definition of uh, what construction means. So they were, they were quite pleased that, uh, to know that we're even building um, a revolutionary way of delivering care to older adults called a household. So if anybody has any other questions about um, construction, feel free to call the administration suite and I can walk you through that. One more administrative uh, tidbit has to do with uh, mailbox delivery or mail delivery. If everyone this weekend could really concentrate on not checking your mailboxes this weekend, I would be incredibly appreciative. There was a lot of uh, intel that came into the admin office and uh, with other various departments, especially the front desk, that many residents were coming down Saturday and Sunday and checking the mailboxes. If you could refrain from that, we would be most appreciative. This is a, uh, this item is a strong mandate from the Department of Health and we are trying, I'm trying to give them updates every day of how compliant we are and we have a pretty good system. We've mailed out twice now times for y'all in the IL building to come down and retrieve your mail. Again, that time slot is not the amount of time you can, you have to exit your apartment and get down to the mailbox. It's just a dedicated time to open your box. Feel free to stretch your legs. If it takes you 20 minutes to walk down here and retrieve your mail within your time, then please plan accordingly. And if you need another 10 or 15 minutes to walk back, go outside, um, please do so. I would encourage you to take advantage of the hand washing portable uh, sinks that the maintenance departments uh, built for y'all that are at every entrance, A wing, B wing, C wing, and park new entrance. Um, in addition, or if you want to use the sanitizer that's still left there, please feel free to do that. And then one last item about transportation. Tomorrow is Wednesday, so that will include our drop off supply shuttle program for those of you that live in the cottages. And tomorrow also continues the uh, grocery shopping with Ann Reed. Everyone has received a flyer with new information about how we're going about that program. I would encourage you to refer to that flyer for more detail. Lastly on my list, there are no known COVID cases at Cedarfield at this time. Every single one of us has a role in keeping this uh, virus out of Cedarfield. Every single one of us has a role in being part of the solution. If we don't, we are putting ourselves at risk and others at risk. Uh, we're gonna step it up this week and all the team members are gonna be wearing masks. I would encourage you, the residents, um, to wear a mask as well. Simple bandana will do. Uh, if you need any information about how to make a mask, uh, we, we have that available as well. Um, one of the most frequently asked questions is, well, can Cedarfield provide me with an N95 mask? And we don't have that amount of inventory. There's probably no one in the United States that has that amount of inventory to provide uh, every single person who lives in a retirement community that type of mask. Uh, we do have a healthy inventory of, N of N95 masks for every team member in the event that we do have a case or two, or I shouldn't say if, when we have a case or two, we have enough uh, N95 masks for uh, the team members. Please be super vigilant tonight and tomorrow morning um, with self-quarantining and social distancing. 
don't let your guard down. These next two weeks are critical for the Commonwealth of Virginia. I know that many of you have heard news reports about certain cities are beginning to flatten their curve. We are not at that point yet. Towards the end of the month, we'll know better whether we're flattening our curve. So don't let your guard down. I will be so appreciative. And I know your neighbors would be, and all of our team members would be as well. So keep up the great work. You're doing great. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lawrence Brooks, who has some spiritual help. Thank you, Michael. And thank you. It's good to be with you all this afternoon. Thank you, as always, for tuning in to these live streams to learn and hear more about Cedarfield and how we're putting measures in to keep this a safe and healthy place. I want to remind you all that this Thursday at 4, we will be live streaming our Monday Thursday service immediately following this live stream with Michael. So that will be on Thursday at 4, immediately following the 3 o'clock live stream with Michael. So make a note, there'll be a slide up as well to remind you of that. This afternoon, I'd like to close with a poem written by John O'Donohue. He was an Irish poet, author, priest, and philosopher. This is from his book, Benedictus, A Book of Blessing. The poem is entitled, This is the Time to Be Slow. This is the time to be slow. Lie low to the wall until the bitter weather passes. Try as best you can not to let the wire rush of doubt scrape from your heart all sense of yourself and your hesitant light. If you remain generous, time will come good, and you will find your feet again on fresh pastures of promise, where the air will be kind and lush with beginning. Thank you. God's peace be with you.